Hello, I'm Shakti Chandra. I taught anatomy at this medical school from 1972 till 2015. And I created all the specimens that you see in this room. Everything that you see in here is real and it's human. And it came from people who donated their body to science. I'm very grateful to them for the ultimate gift because if they didn't donate, I wouldn't have anything to work and you wouldn't have anything to see. You know, these are all real, but you might wonder, why do they look like plastic? That's because they have been plastinated to preserve them. Uh, you replace the, all the body fluids with a resin, which is plastic, and uh, then you cure it and harden it, so it stays in that position, and uh, it can stay for a long time. It has some disadvantages, but more advantages than that. Before I start talking about each of these specimens, I have one simple question for you and that is what do you think is the most amazing thing in the whole wide world you know something you call cool awesome great we say that word so many times what is something that's great to you people hesitate to say and then sometimes they'll say oh the cell phone or they'll say we love playing hockey or something like that but to me who made the cell phone who plays hockey who uses the computers? We do. So it's not those things that are amazing. It's the human body, which is the most amazing thing in the whole wide world. And you are here to see different parts of the body and learn from it about your own body. I would like you to make a fist and then open and close it and do that about 60 times a minute. That is what your little heart does all day long, all night long. And it keeps on pumping blood to the whole body from head to toe. Your heart is as big as your fist. That's why I asked you to make a fist. And it fits like this. You'll say, well, it's still outside. Look, that's how it fits into the chest cavity like that. It's almost in the midline. It's a little more to the left than the right. And the rib cage is there to protect the heart and to protect the lungs. I'm sure you've heard of people having a heart attack and you wonder why. And then someone might say, well, these arteries get blocked because for the heart to pump, it needs blood, which goes to them by these small arteries. This is a cast of the coronary arteries which supply the heart. I injected the arteries with the red latex and then dissolved the tissue. So what you are seeing here are all the branches, the smallest one through which uh, the blood flows through to supply the heart muscle itself. And you can see that the largest one of these arteries is not very large. And if this artery gets blocked here where I'm holding it, then no blood can flow through and all this part of the heart will receive no blood. And as a result, uh, that part would die and the person would have a massive heart attack. Here, you're looking at a heart of somebody who had a double bypass. You are seeing one in front here. So this part of the artery from between my thumb and finger was got blocked. So they took a vein perhaps from the leg and connected one end out here to big artery. And the blood could come down like this, like this, and then go down beyond the blocked part. And so the heart tissue could live. Similarly, this person had another bypass and this right here is the other bypass. You can see this blue thread which was used to stitch the arteries. Do you have any holes in your heart? Most people say no, 
But if you didn't have any holes, then how would the blood go through or flow through from one chamber to the next? In this one, we all have more than 10 or 12 holes in the heart. But when you say somebody has a hole, that just means that they have an extra hole in the heart. I would like you to take a deep breath. Breathe in and breathe out. Breathe in and breathe out. When you breathe in, the air goes inside the lungs. This that I'm holding is one lung. It is nice and soft and spongy and this one feels like styrofoam only because it's plastinated. It's really healthy. It has a few black spots but that's because of the pollutants in the atmosphere. This person didn't smoke. And I bet you're wondering, this lung is so big, how does it fit inside? Look, I can show it to you again how it fits. That's the way it fits inside. And again, when the lung is inside the chest cavity, it will only expand as much as the ribs can expand. Whereas when it is outside, you can of course inflate it a lot more and it might be a little larger. The other thing is that you not only have what you need, you even have extra. If a lobe of this lung or a part of this lung was removed, then the rest of the lung will inflate to fill up the space and you could even live on one lung to smoke or not to smoke. The choice is yours. Nobody can take a cigarette and put it to your lips and go, only you can. People who smoke have a greater chance of getting lung cancer. I have a specimen here of a slice of a lung from somebody who had lung cancer. All these little spots that you see are cancerous spots. Now once you get cancer, it's too late. But you know something? If while there's life, there's hope. So never give up hope. If this person had quit smoking and did not smoke for five years, chances are that the lung would be good, normal, healthy, as good as this. This is a chest cavity which was open and the lung was removed from here. In fact, you can see I can put it back in there. Here is the lung in place and there it's removed space that you see over here, that's where the heart was. This here is the diaphragm. By the way, any idea how many times my heart has beaten? It's already beaten more than two and a half billion times. In this specimen, you are looking at the heart, the lungs and the diaphragm all together. So you can see how part of the lungs comes over the heart. That's the heart. Here we have a few more hearts uh, dissected to show different things. This is a heart that was cut into two. Here you can see that's the septum which divides the two ventricles and this upper part of it is quite thin. And we can put these two together and you'll see that's how the heart was. So I'm sure you all had something to eat or drink. Where's that stuff right now? In the stomach. This J-shaped structure that I'm holding is the stomach. This is the esophagus. Everything you eat or drink has to go down through that narrow opening. And this is how the stomach fits in the body. Or if you were to put it in the skeleton, so the esophagus is going to come all the way from the neck. That's where it starts and then through the chest and then into the abdomen. This part here, this thin structure, that is the diaphragm. So here's a balloon. Look how small it is. And now it is big. And then when you get low, let go, it gets small again. And that's what happens to the food in the stomach. Once that's gone down, it uh, becomes small again. And also you could think of the balloon and compare it to the lungs. When you breathe in, that takes effort and the lungs expand. And when you breathe out, then the lungs collapse.
this here these are my guts you know these are all the guts actually this has the stomach in this upper part and then this intestine that small intestine more small more small then large intestine and then more large and there's the end of it so all these guts you have more than uh, 24 feet of that they fit in like this or to show it in the skeleton at and that piece of popcorn that you eat has to go down through 24 feet of that intestine. Your body keeps what is good and what is not good and it doesn't need goes out a day later or two days later when you go and do your poo. And in fact, I think you should pay attention to what you eat and to emphasize that fact, I made this poster. It says, you are what you eat. On one side of the body are things which are not so good for you and on the other side of the body are things that are supposed to be good for you. You feel like having bacon and pizza and french fries and donuts. Have them, but not all the time. Not too much. A little bit is okay because think Everything that your body does, it makes, whether it is blood or bone or tissue or anything else, is from that plate full of food that you put inside. So why not pay attention to it? To protect the intestines, we have this abdominal wall, just like the rib cage, but this is made of muscle. It's uh, flexible, it can expand, and that's what you're looking at. And look, here's the belly button. That's to remind you about your mother's. That's how you received all your nutrition when you were in mother's tummy. So never forget your mother. These here are the abs you know this is what you call abs these three here and the one in the midline on this side you are seeing it on this side i removed that that's the six pack that's another muscle you know we all have a six pack only sometimes it's a little more pronounced than other times and this abdominal wall would be attached like so to these bones and all around like that this specimen here, you can see, this is what is called uh, organ package. So you have all the viscera, all the organs. You have the lungs and the heart, the diaphragm, that's the liver. This is the stomach. And then this is part of the large intestine. These are small intestines, more small, and there's some large intestine. And when we turn it around, you can see from the back, that's part of the diaphragm and the structures again. Somebody might be wondering or would ask me, where's the appendix? Actually, in this specimen, as well as the other one, the appendix was removed. Normally, it should be about at that point where the small intestine joins on with the large intestine. But in this specimen here, you can see that this finger-like projection is the appendix. This is part of the small intestine, and that's part of the large intestine. It is this little projection which often causes problems in people, and then uh, they need to have it operated or removed. This here is a liver. It's a healthy liver. It came from a big person, and that's why it's big. This dark green sac here is the gallbladder. This tube here is the inferior vena cava. Now this is nice and healthy. The reason it looks red is because the liver was injected with the dye, uh, or the arteries were, and so that's what you are seeing through it. When you are old enough to have an alcoholic drink and want to have one, have one, but never too much. If you drink too much alcohol, you may end up with a liver like this. This liver is all shriveled and it's got these lumps and bumps. This is a cirrhotic liver. People who drink a lot have greater chance of getting cirrhosis. And once again, I would urge you to look after yourself. And what I would say is that, just to give you another example to drive these things home, many of you drive, or if you don't, your parents do. 
What do you put in the car for it to run? You'd say gas. Just once, just for once, take a bottle of water and put it into the tank. You won't do it, would you? Not even once. Because if you did, the car's going to stop. Sure, it will. The engine will cease. So, how many cars are you likely to have in a lifetime? Maybe three, four, at least more than one? How many bodies do you have? One. So, you are willing to look after the car which you can replace a lot better than your own body that you have one off to last you a lifetime. I urge you to look after yourself a bit better. This specimen here shows the part of the intestine here, but this structure all the way along, that is the pancreas. And pancreas has two main functions. One is to produce a hormone, insulin, which has to do with the regulation of blood sugar, and the other is to produce uh, some uh, enzymes for digestion of food. This other structure over here, that is the spleen. And uh, I can also show how this fits in the skeleton. So the liver is on the right side and the spleen goes on the left side. It's opposite the lower three ribs and the pancreas goes all the way across. It's right next to the vertebrae or very close to the vertebrae, it's far back. This here is a upper limb dissected to show all the nerves which go to supply the various muscles. You can also see the main artery, but then it's mainly done for the nerves. These two shoulders came from the same person as the thorax that I showed you earlier on. And these were dissected to show the muscles around the shoulder joint. So this is part of the clavicle. Here is the acromion. There is the head of the humerus. And then there are these other uh, nerves and vessels and some muscles. This is an artery and a nerve that first goes to supply these muscles up here and then it goes around and comes around the bone to come and supply these over here. This is a similar thing but done to show again uh, slightly deeper structures. This big muscle here that has been opened out, that is the deltoid. And the reason the muscle can stay like that is because I put some p ne uh, needles and pins inside to hold it in the, that position before fixing the specimen. You look at this hand, you would notice that this finger is a lot smaller than others. In fact, if you look at it closely, you would see that it has no nail. This finger was amputated. Uh, for the other thing here, I removed most of the tendons and stuff in here to show this space, which is the carpal tunnel. The probe that I'm putting through is going through the carpal tunnel. And that is how all these tendons go from this part of the forearm into the hand. Here, you can see these tendons quite nicely. And uh, these are the tendons that I move like in here, and those are the tendons that you're seeing over there. On this side, you can see these nerves, and these are the nerves right there. And these are the tendons again. Here we have two knees. Again, one has a, a deeper structure shown, the other one uh, more nearer the skin. So this is the kneecap that has been uh, reflected, bent backwards, so you could look inside the knee. And this structure here is the meniscus. That's just like the cushion, so you don't move one bone next to the other bone, and uh, there's a cushion in between. And this here, that is a ligament, which holds these two bones together. That's called the MCL. You often hear of people injuring their MCL and LCL. This one here, cord-like structure, is the lateral collateral ligament.
and then there are two ligaments which are inside going from one bone to the other. I'll show that to you in another specimen, you'll see it better. But because those two ligaments go like a cross, like an X, those are called cruciate ligaments. And you can see that in this one right here. And I can bend this slightly so you can see that better. So this here is the ACL. This is the meniscus. And to see the PCL, you see from behind over there. Now I would like you to please stand up. And then stand on your toes and stretch. And then stand on one foot. And then you can turn around. And now sit down or stand on both feet. And now here is a foot. That is a foot that you were standing on. Can you believe that? When you stand on your toes, that's how they are a little bent like this. You're standing on that. There are 26 bones in one foot and you were standing on it and that was supporting the weight of the whole body and didn't even sway or fall down. Isn't that amazing? And having seen that foot now, where you will articulate with the other bones later, you can see that here is one foot right there. And uh, here, these are the tendons. And this is the bump of the ankle. This is the Achilles tendon. That is the strongest, biggest tendon in the body. And this is the other bump on the outside of the foot, what is called malleolus. These two bumps are formed by two bones which are in the leg and I'd show those to you next. Now if you come to the other side of the room, we can see those other bones for the sake of continuity. So these are the two bones in the leg and uh, this is how they will join with each other. And actually, I didn't bring the foot here, but so this forms the bump on the outside right here and this one on the inside of the leg. And then joining with these two, this bone up here is the thigh bone. And that fits like this. So you see, it's just these two bones, the femur, which is the longest bone in the body, and the tibia that join together to form the knee joint. This is the uh, proximal end or the upper end of the femur. And you see that it has a nice rounded head. And that head or ball of like structure fits in the socket of the hip bone like this. So that's how you have the hip joint or the ball and socket joint. Sometimes people break this bone and break their hip and some it, sometimes it needs to be replaced. So what they do then is to take this metal piece and they'll saw off, saw off this part of the bone, put this in, hammer it in, put some glue around it and stitch up all the muscles. This little piece of metal weighs 500 grams. It comes in various sizes and that depends on the size of the person you're putting it in. Sometimes even the socket in the hip bone needs to be replaced and these are two different sockets that one may use to replace that. In fact, further down in this room over there, uh, there's a specimen which has an artificial hip in it. That's the way it was when I got the specimen. Also, sometimes people need to have their knee replaced and in that uh, what they would need to do then is to replace this part of the femur with this piece of metal. So they'll again cut that off here, fit this in. These two prong-like structures go inside. This whitish stuff that you see on the metal is the bone that has grown into it. And they'll take another piece which is like this and that would go into the tibia. So again, if you look, these two look 
uh, alike. So they'll cut this part off here, put this in, this metal will go in, and then uh, the two things will join like this. So when the person walks, they'll be moving this. And since you don't want to have metal on metal, you put a bit of plastic. But look, what happened to this plastic? After a few years, maybe 10, maybe 15, it got worn out. If it was your own cartilage, your body will make cartilage and replace it. Body doesn't make plastic. And for that reason, this joint had to be taken out and replaced with a new one. And that's how I have this to show it to you. So yes, it is great that they can replace joints, but replace things or artificial things are never as good as the original. Since I showed you the largest or the longest bone in the body, do you know where the smallest bones are and how small are they? Just think about it. Are they the size of your pinky? Well, now that you have imagined, here are the smallest bones in the body. These three bones are inside your ear. And not only they are there, they move, they vibrate, and if they didn't move, you wouldn't hear. Here is a string of the vertebrae, what is called the backbone. There are a whole lot of these vertebrae. Most of them are separate, and a few of them are joined together. That's what forms the backbone, and these vertebrae are there to protect the spinal cord. Just like I can put my finger inside the vertebrae, the spinal cord would be going inside and the spinal nerves will be coming from these holes on the sides. In between these uh, vertebrae are the discs and in fact you can uh, uh, see those over here. Here are the vertebrae, you are seeing the bodies, but on the back side, no actually, sorry, you'll see that in another way, but here you can see the spinal cord as it lies inside the canal, the vertebrae have been opened up, and these that you see going on either side, these are the spinal nerves. This one here, you can note that as they come further down the vertebral canal, the spinal cord ends, it ends about there, and then all you are left with these little strings, these are the nerves, uh, nerve roots actually. You are looking at the uh, torso, the pelvis part of the cadaver for which you saw the uh, shoulder and knees and the thorax. And uh, here we have removed most of the organs. So you are looking at this thin sheet of muscle that forms the floor of the pelvis. This here is the aorta and that is part of the vertebral body right there. These in the legs are some of the muscles and these here are more, that's the gluteal region or the back region. This is the gluteus maximus, your glutes, the biggest big muscle. This big fat nerve here is the sciatic nerve. See how that's coming down the leg? This here, if you were to imagine that this pelvis was cut right in the midline, but the organs were not removed, and you are now looking at those organs from the side. So this here is the bone in front, that is the pubis. This thing here is the bladder, and this is the uterus. This right here is the vagina, and this is the uh, rectum and the anal canal. Just see what the difference, it's the same side, same thing. So here's the pubic symphysis, here is the bladder, but look at this uterus. This big thing that you see in the middle all here, this is a fibroid, a tumor that this person had. And this is the other half of that. So you can see that section was not right in the midline. So you can see more of the bladder uh, and uh, this one and the vagina. There's the anal canal, rectum, and there's the uterus. This thing in front here between my thumb and finger, that is the bladder. You know, 
The kidneys, you have your own filtration plant. They are making the pee all the time, drop by drop. It keeps coming down. And that's where it collects. And again, you say, wow, that's it? Well, again, that bladder is empty. If it wasn't empty, it would be much bigger. And you know, a lot of times people don't want to talk about pee, but every single person needs to make at least 500 milliliters of urine in a day to be healthy. This here, this white thing you're seeing here is a catheter that they had put in the patient uh, for the urine to come out. And this thing here, this that I'm holding now, the small structure, three inches by two inch, almost an inch thick, that is the house we all grew up in when we were in our mother's tummy. That is the uterus. Can you imagine a six pound or an eight pound baby growing in that? But that's how it expands, everything expands. And that, for that reason, and look how close the uterus is to the bladder and how it presses on it, that when people are pregnant, they need to go to the bathroom a lot more often, they eat more frequently, and they can't eat too much at a time. That is the ovary, that small little thing. And these little fimbriated things, these little fluffs, these are the uh, fimbriae belonging to the fallopian tube. When I tilt this specimen, you can see this black thing sticking out of the cervix. That opening is the cervix. It's opening into this, which is the vagina. And that black thing that is sticking out is a polyp or a tumor that this person had. These are the two kidneys. We have our own filtration plant. They filter all the blood, so the good part goes back in and all the impurities go down this little tube, which is called the ureter. You know, one can easily live on one kidney, but you cannot live without a kidney. If your kidneys are not working, you will need to have dialysis. This uh, specimen, I want you to give particular attention to this lower part. These are the coils of the intestine, but this that you see right here, that is the bladder. And this at the base of the bladder, this thing, like a walnut or the size of that, that is the prostate. And as I turn it around, you can see that these are the ureters coming down from the kidneys. So here the kidneys are in place, and this is one ureter, and that is the other one. See how close the kidneys are uh, to the lung or to the other uh, intestinal organs, to the abdominal organs. In this particular specimen, if you were to look closely again at this uh, lower part, you would be able to see that this is the uterus, that what I'm touching here is the uterus, this is the bladder, and then in there, the small thing is the ovary. You may or may not be able to see that clearly in that specimen. So you've seen a lot of things. Can you think of something that I haven't pointed out yet? Well, that's the brain. And you know, the brain is so delicate that even if you touched it gently, you damage it. So to protect the brain, we keep it inside this skull. All this skull made up of different bones which are fused with each other to protect the brain. And the only bone which is not fused or which you can move is the jaw. You can open your jaw, close it, stick at it, move it side to side to chew the food. So you want to see the brain inside? Say open sesame. And there you go. There's the brain inside. Now this brain shrunk during plastination. That's why you have so much space around it. Otherwise it should fit really well. If I take this brain out, does it remind you of any nut? They say the brain looks like a walnut and actually walnuts are good for you. So every day I take a few walnuts, crush them and put them in my cereal. Who has a thicker skull? Boys or girls? Some people would say boys. Why? 
Do they need to protect their brain more? Or is it that they don't understand so much? So you say, oh, I've got a thick skull. No, the, the answer is because they're boys. Boys are different from girls. All the bones are thicker and heavier in men or boys as compared to girls. That's the way they are. If you look at the skull in the same person, parts of the skull are very thick or are thicker as compared to the other parts which are thin. If I lift it up, you can even see the light coming through some parts which are very thin. So to protect your own brain, when you go out and do things like skiing or skating or hockey or cycling, to emphasize the protection given by a helmet to your brain, I cut this helmet at, at to show that. So you see how much extra protection it provides to your brain when you put it on your head. So when you do things, fun things like that, you must wear a helmet. And it doesn't matter if you're going a short distance or on a sh short hill or a small hill. Here is a picture of Natasha Richardson. She was a 40-year-old actress who went to ski on a bunny slope in Mont Tremblant, and she was not wearing a helmet. She fell down, and then she got up and said she was fine. But unfortunately, she wasn't, and four days later, she was dead. Here is a skull that was cut right in the midline and the brain cut the same way to show you how it fits. This connection right here and this is where the two halves of the brain are connected. This part here is separate. This specimen here is to give you a better idea of how everything is in place when the head and the neck are cut right in the midline. So you can see here's the brain inside. This little membrane that you see, that's part of the dura that comes between the two halves of the brain. This tiny thing, that is the pituitary, that small master gland which controls so many organs or hormones. This is the brain stem and that is the cerebellum. This here is the tongue. Do you ever think that the tongue was so big? And this here is part of the nose. These openings that you see, those are the sinuses. I'm sure you've all had sinusitis at one point or another. Those sinuses are air spaces lined with mucous membrane inside the skull. That is one here, there's another one here, and there are some more. These here are the vertebral bodies and these things in between, you see, these are the vertebral discs or intervertebral discs that I mentioned and couldn't show earlier. Here is the spinal cord. Another thing, see there's hardly four centimeters of space between the front, the skin in front of the neck and the front of the vertebral body. This thing right here is the trachea and Behind that, behind the trachea and in front of the vertebrae is the esophagus. Did you think that the food that you eat or drink that you have go in front of the vertebral bodies? Notice this big thing here and you'd say, what is that? Well, I suggest that if you look just at the part from below this line, just at this lower part, it's about the same size as this. Whereas this upper part here is this, all this upper part. This is the skull of a, someone who had hydrocephalus, that means water in the uh, skull or in the brain. And all this is the ventricle. All this space, normally there's only a small bit of space that produces the cerebrospinal fluid. But in this person, something went, went wrong, so the fluid couldn't be drained, and it kept growing and growing. The fluid collected in there, and so the bones kept stretching. 
these are different bones that may make up the skull but in the baby when they're born these bones are not fused together there's a big gap over here and there's another gap here those are called the soft spots but even besides these joints between the two bones are not tight and so if there's anything causing extra pressure or accumulation of lot of fluid then it can expand here we've dissected the muscles of the eye and the nerves in there and at this point I was really pleased because when I cut it, it went in such a way that you can see these tiny ossicles inside the ear. So this point right there is the eardrum and between here and here those tiny small things are the ossicles and then these are other nerves and muscles in the neck. So now that we saw the brain and uh, part of the spinal cord, here is the uh, rest of the spinal cord. So just look at the thickness of the spinal cord. It's not very thick, is it? And there it's coming down, 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 and then these are just the uh, rootlets. This is what is called corda equina because these look like a horse's tail, hence the name for that. Now when you t look at the spinal cord, and now I want you to think of somebody who's in a car accident, was not wearing a seat belt, and the head goes, snaps like this, and they break their neck. When you hear of somebody breaking their neck, it's not the neck that they've broken, it's the uh, spinal cord that gets cut at whatever point. So when the spinal cord is cut, then no information can go up or to the brain or come from the brain to the lower part of the body and that's when the person gets paralyzed from that breakdown. If the break was high enough, then even the nerve going to the diaphragm uh, is uh, damaged and so the person won't be able to breathe. This one here, you can see this lung and look how black it is. So this person smoked a lot. This is where the uh, heart was. These are the some of the openings there. On this side, the lung was removed a little bit at a time so you could see the branches of the main bronchus. That is the uh, superior vena cava. This is the diaphragm that separates the chest above from the abdomen below. And in the abdomen here, you can see this is the a pancreas. And here is one kidney, and you can see the other kidney is right there. Look how far back it's situated. And it's for this reason that when people need to have operations on the kidney, they don't go from front, but rather uh, they go from behind because you can reach the kidney a lot easier without increasing the chances of infection to the other uh, structures. This here is the bladder. And as I turn it around, you can see, and on this side, I removed the muscle from this region. This is the uh, tailbone. This is the sacrum. And all these muscles which are forming the pelvic diaphragm, uh, I removed that, and the rectum and the anal canal. So you can look at the prostate from behind. This is the prostate. All this structure is the prostate. This sac here and this one here, these are the seminal vesicles. This here and this here is the vast deference coming from the two sides and coming together. Again, you can see the sciatic nerve and all these big muscles here. These are the hamstrings coming down the uh, knee then into the leg and that is the Achilles tendon. And this particular uh, specimen, we cut the body right in the midline. Unfortunately for me, the section did go right in the midline. So you see the spinal cord almost all the way down like that. And once again, you can see the intervertebral discs quite nicely. And this part looks black as compared to this because this section between here and here was cut 
after the body was plastinated but before it was cured and so it didn't get bleached or it looks different. But what is really amazing to me is, look at this space. There doesn't seem to be very much space in here. And that's where all the organs fit, whether it's the lungs and the heart and the stomach, intestine, kidneys, etc., etc. And as you come down and you look at this bladder, look how much bigger this one is. That's because there was urine in the bladder when the person died, so it stayed that way. That is the rectum, and then here is the anal canal. That is the pubic bone in front, and this is the prostate. In fact, the section went so much in the midline that you could see how the urethra begins at the base of the bladder, goes through the prostate, and then all the way down the penis. This is the other half of that uh, person. And then this one, perhaps you could point out these are the two sinuses that we mentioned, paranasal sinuses. This is inside the nose. This here is the hard palate. That's the uvula, that little thing that hangs at the back. This big structure is the tongue. Here is the uh, mandible or the lower jawbone. And this is where the esophagus, back of the throat comes down, esophagus begins, and the trachea begins right here. This flap-like thing is the epiglottis that comes down when you swallow food so that the food doesn't go into the trachea but goes down into the esophagus. And this one here, again dissected a little differently just to keep the rib cage intact. You're wondering why these two look different, the difference between this part and here. This part here, 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 that's all bone, whereas this front part is cartilage. And when the uh, cartilage looks different, and that's why when you look at a skeleton that has been articulated, you will see bits of plastic uh, put to replace the cartilage because the cartilage dissolves as the bones are prepared. The whole length of the uh, spinal cord, starting here at the base of the skull, coming down. Here it is surrounded by the dura or the meninges, that's part of the vertebrae there. And then here the dura is open, so you can see inside how it lies. And again, to give reference here, and then these are the parts where there's no spinal cord. That's why when somebody is doing a lumbar puncture, in which they put a needle into the vertebral canal to take out some cerebrospinal fluid, they do it at a lower level when there's no spinal cord, so they don't injure the spinal cord. The nerves are floating in the fluid, so they go to one side and you can withdraw the fluid. Another interesting thing in this specimen is that on this side you see only one sciatic nerve. It's coming down as a whole. Whereas on this, the two parts of the sciatic nerve are coming separately. This muscle is piriformis. Part of the nerve is coming through the piriformis and part of the nerve is coming below. We've taken a big tour, I probably mentioned most of the things. Take your time to look around, think about things, and pay attention. And my last question to you is, who do you think is the most important person in this room at this time? I'd like you to take your hand, point to yourself, and say, I am. And remember that, that you are the most important person as far as you are concerned in the whole wide world. And you are the most amazing thing in the whole wide world. And I suggest that you look after yourself. And to look after this incredible machine of yours, you need to do three things. You got to feed it. You are what you eat, so pay attention. You got to move it. If you don't move, you'll seize up and you've got to rest it because that's when the body recuperates. You do those three things and you can do what you want in life, have fun and good luck, take care.